Vikings of the Gloves, Robert Irvin Howard. No sooner had the sea girl docked in Yokohama than Mushy Hansen beat it down the waterfront to see if he could match me at some good fight club. Pretty soon he come back and said, no chance, Steve. You'd have to be a Scandinavian to get a scrap right now, what do you mean by them remarks? I asked, suspiciously, well, said Mushy, the sealin fleets in, and so likewise is the whalers, and the ports swarm in with squareheads, well, what's that got to do? They ain't but one fight club on the waterfront said Mushy, and it's run by a Dutchman named Naaman. He's been put in on a series of elimination contests, and, from what I hear, he's been cleaning up. He matches Swedes against Danes, see? Well, there's hundreds of square heads in port, and naturally each race turns out to support its countrymen. So far, the Danes is ahead. You ever hear of a Kantor Kilsen? You bet, I said. I ain't never seen him perform, but they say he's their real goods. Sales on the Viking. Out of Copenhagen, don't he? Yeah. And the Vikings in port. Night before last, a can flatten Sven Tortevigsen, the terrible Swede, in three rounds, and tonight he takes on Dirk Jacobsen, the Gotland giant. The Swedes and the Danes is fighting all over the waterfront, said Mushy, and they're betting their socks. I sunk a few bucks on her can myself. But that's the way she stands, Steve. Nobody but Scandinavians need apply. Well, heck, I complained. How come I got to be the victim of race prejudice? I need dough. I'm flat broke. Wouldn't this mug name and give me a preliminary scrap? For ten dollars I'll fight any three square heads in port all in the same ring, nor, said Mushy, they ain't going to be no preliminaries. Naaman says the crowd'll be too impatient to set through M. Boy, oh boy, will there be excitement. Whichever way it goes, they's bound to be a rough house, a pretty lookout, I said bitterly, when a sea girl the fightinest ship on the seven seas, ain't represented in the melee. I got a good mind to blow in and bust up the whole show. At this moment Bill O'Brien hove in sight, looking excited, hot dog. He yelled. Here's a chance for us to clean up some dough, stand by to come about, I advised, and give us the lay. Well, Bill said, I just been down along the waterfront listening to them square heads argy and, boy, is the money changing hands. I seen six fights already. Well, just now they come word that Dirk Jacobson had broke his wrist, swinging for a sparring partner and hitting the wall instead. So I ran down to Naaman's arena to find out if it was so, and the Dutchman was walking the floor and tear in his hair. He said he'd pay a hundred bucks extra, win or lose, to a man good enough to go in with Tork Hilson. He says if he calls the show off, these square heads will hang him. So I see where we can run a seagull man in and cop the jack, and who you think we can use? I asked skeptically. Well, there's Mushy, began Bill. He was raised in America, of course, but, yeah, there's Mushy. Snapped Mushy, bitterly. You know as well as I do that I ain't no Swede. I'm a Dane myself. Far from wanting to fight Hakan, I hope he knocks the block off for whatever fool Swede they finds to go against him. That's gratitude, said Bill, scathingly. How can a brainy man like me work up anything big when I gets opposition from all quarters? I lays awake nights studying up plans for the betterment of my mates, and what do I get? Arguments. Wisecracks. Opposition. I tell ya, or, pipe down, I said. There's Sven Larsen he's a Swede, that big ox would last about fifteen seconds against Hakan, said Mushy, with gloomy satisfaction. Besides, Sven's in jail. He hadn't been in port more than a half hour when he got jugged for beating up a cop. Bill fixed a gloomy gaze on me, and his eyes lighted. Hot dog. He whooped. I got it. Steve, you're a Swede, listen here, you flat-headed dogfish, I began, in ire, me and you ain't had a fight in years, but by golly. Or, try to have some sense, said Bill. This is the idea, you ain't never fought in Yokohama before. Name and don't know you, nor anybody else. We'll pass you off a Swede, pass him off for a Swede? Gawp mushy, well, said Bill, I'll admit he don't look much like a Swede much like a Swede. I gnashed, my indignation mounting. Why, you son of a, well, you don't look nothing like a Swede then. Snapped Bill, disgustedly, but we can pass you off for one. I reckon if we tell them you're a Swede, they can't prove you ain't. If they dispute it, we'll knock the daylights out of em. I thought it over, not so bad, I finally decided. We'll get that hundred extra and, for a chance to fight somebody, I'd pretend I was a Eskimo. We'll do it. Good. Said Bill. Can you talk Swedish? Sure, I said. Listen, 
Yummy yaks and yumped off the yakka bladder with his monkey yakket on. Yummy, what a yump, pretty good, said Bill. Come on, we'll go down to Naaman's and sign up. Hey, ain't you going, Mushy? No, I ain't, said Mushy sourly. I see right now I ain't going to enjoy the scrap none. Steve's my shipmate but Hawkins my countryman. Whichever loses, I won't rejoice none. I hope it's a draw. I ain't even going to see it, well, he went off by himself, and I said to Bill, I got a good mind not to go on with this, since Mushy feels that way about it, or, he'll get over it, said Bill. My gosh, Steve, this here's a matter of business. Ain't we all busted? Mushy'll feel all right after we split your purse three ways and he has a few shots of hard liquor, well, all right, I said. Let's get down to Naaman's, so me and Bill and my white bulldog, Mike, went down to Naaman's, and, as we walked in, Bill hissed, don't forget to talk Swedish, a short, fat man, which I reckoned was Naaman, was sitting and looking over a list of names, and now and then he'd take a long pull out of a bottle, and then he'd cuss fit to curl your toes, and pull his hair, well, Naaman, said Bill, cheerfully, what you doing, I got a list of all the Swedes in port which think they can fight, said Naaman, bitterly, they ain't one of em would last five seconds against Torkilson. I'll have to call it off, no you won't, said Bill. Right here I got the fightinest Swede in the Asiatics. Naaman faced around quick to look at me, and his eyes flared, and he jumped up like he'd been stung, get out of here. He yelped. You should come around here and mock me in my misery. A sweet time for practical jokes, or, cool off, said Bill. I tell you this Swede can lick a contour Kilson with his right thumb in his mouth, Swede. Snorted Naaman. You must think I'm a prize sucker bringing this black-headed Mick around here and telling me, Mick. Baloney. Said Bill. Look at them blue eyes, I'm looking at em, snarled Naaman, and thinking of the lakes of Kalani all the time. Sweet? Ha. Huh. Then so was John L. Sullivan. So you're a Swede, are you? Sure, I said. I bane Swedish, mister, what part of Sweden? He barked, Gotland, I said, and simultaneous Bill said, Stockholm, and we glared at each other in mutual irritation. Cork, you'd better say, sneered Naaman, I am a Swede, I said, annoyed. I want das fight, get out of here and quit wasting my valuable time, snarled Naaman. If you're a Swede, then I'm a Hindu princess. At this insulting insinuation I lost my temper. I despise as a man that's so suspicious he don't trust his fellow men. Grabbing Naaman by the neck with a vise-like grip, and waggling a huge fist under his nose, I roared, you insulting monkey. Am I a Swede or ain't I? He turned pale and shook like an aspirin leaf. You're a Swede, he agreed, weakly, and I get the fight? I rumbled, you get it, he agreed, wiping his brow with a bandana. The square heads may stretch my neck for this, but maybe, if you keep your mouth shut, we'll get by. What's your name? Steve I began, thoughtlessly, when Bill kicked me on the shin and said, Lazivarsen. All right, said Naaman, pessimistically, I'll announce it that I got a man to fight Torkilson. How much do I how much I bane get? I asked, I guaranteed a thousand bucks to the fighters, he said, to be split seven hundred to the winner and three hundred to the loser, give me dust losers in now, I demanded. I bane go out and bet him, you bet your life, so he did, and said, you better keep off of the street, some of your countrymen might ask you about the folks back home in dear old Stockholm. And, with that, he gave a bitter screech of raucous and irritating laughter, and slammed the door, and as we left, we heard him moaning like he had the bellyache, I don't believe he thinks I'm a Swede, I said, resentfully, who cares? Said Bill. We got the match. But he's right. I'll go place the bets. You keep out of sight. Long as you don't say much, we're safe. But, if you go wandering around, some square head'll start talking Swedish to you and will be sunk, all right, I said. I'll get me a room at the sailor's board in house we seen down Mancha Road. I'll stay there till it's time for the scrap. So Bill went off to lay the bets, and me and Mike went down the back alleys toward the place I mentioned. As we turned out of a side street into Mancha Road, somebody come around the corner moving fast, and fell over Mike, who didn't have time to get out of the way, the fella scrambled up with a wrathful roar. A big blonde bizzock he was, and he didn't look like a sailor. He drawed back his foot to kick Mike, as if it was the dog's fault. But I circumvented him by the simple process of kicking him severely on the shin, drop it, cull. I growled, as he began hopping around, howling wordlessly and holding his shin. It wasn't Mike's fault, and you hadn't no cause to kick him. Anyhow, 
He'd have ripped your leg off if you'd landed. Instead of being pacified, he gave a bloodthirsty yell and socked me on the jaw. Seeing he was one of them bullheaded mugs you can't reason with, I banged him once with my right, and left him setting dizzily in the gutter picking imaginary violets. Proceeding on my way to the Siemens Borden's house, I forgot all about the incident. Such trifles is too common for me to spend much time thinking about. But, as it come out, I had cause to remember it. I got me a room and stayed there with the door shut till Bill come in, jubilant, and said the crew of the Sea Girl had sunk all the money it could borrow at heavy odds. If you lose, said he, most of us will go back to the ship we're in barrels, me lose? I snorted disgustedly. Don't be absurd. Where's the old man? Or, I seen him down at that dive of antiquity, the purple cat bar, a while ago, said Bill. He was pretty well lit and having some kind of argument with old Captain J. Jessup. He'll be at the fight all right. I didn't say nothing to him, but he'll be there, he'll more likely land in jail for fighting old Jid, I ruminated. They hate each other like snakes. Well, that's his own lookout. But I'd like him to see me lick talk Hilson. I heard him bragging about the square head the other day. Seems like he seen him fight once someplace. Well, said Bill, it's nearly time for the fight. Let's get going. We'll go down back alleys and sneak into the arena from the rear, so none of them admiring Swedes can get a hold of you and find out you're really a American make. Come on, so we done so, accompanied by three Swedes of the Sea Girls crew who was loyal to their ship and their shipmates. We snuck along alleys and slunk into the back rooms of the arena, where Naaman come into us, perspiring freely, and told us he was having a heck of a time keeping Swedes out of the dressing room. He said numbers of them wanted to come in and shake hands with Lars Sivarsson before he went out to uphold the fair name of Sweden. He said Hakan was getting in the ring, and for us to hustle, so we went up the aisle hurriedly, and the crowd was so busy cheering for Hakan that they didn't notice us till we was in the ring. I looked out over the house, which was packed, setting and standing, and square heads fighting to get in when there wasn't room for no more. I never knew there was that many Scandinavians in eastern waters. It looked like every man in the house was a Dane, a Norwegian or a sweet big, blonde fellas, all roaring like bulls in their excitement. It looked like a stormy night, Naaman was walking around the ring, bowing and grinning, and every now and then his gaze would just fall on me as I sat in my corner and he would shudder visibly and wipe his forehead with his bandana. Meanwhile, a big Swedish sea captain was acting the part of the announcer, and was making quite a ceremony out of it. He would just boom out jovially, and the crowd would just roar in various alien tongues and I told one of the Swedes from the Sea Girl to translate for me, which he done so in a whisper, while pretending to tie on my gloves. This is what the announcer was saying, tonight all Scandinavia is represented here in this glorious forthcoming struggle for supremacy. In my mind it brings back days of the Vikings. This is a Scandinavian spectacle for Scandinavian sailors. Every man involved in this contest is Scandinavian. You will that know who can talk Kilsen, the pride of Denmark. Whereupon, all the Danes in the crowd bellowed. I haven't met Lars Ivarsson, but the very fact that he is a son of Sweden assures us that he will prove no mean opponent for Denmark's favoured son. It was the Swedes' turn to roar. I now present the referee, John Yasen, of Norway. This is a family affair. Remember, whichever way the fight goes, it will lend glory to Scandinavia. Then he turned and pointed toward the opposite corner and roared, I can talk Kilsen, of Denmark. Again the Danes thundered to the skies and Bill O'Brien hissed in my ear. Don't forget when your interviews say to Spain happiest moment of my life. The accent will convince em you're a Swede. The announcer turned toward me and, as his eyes fell on me for the first time, he started violently and blinked. Then he kind of mechanically pulled himself together and stammered, Lars Ivarsson of Sweden, I raise, shedding my bathrobe, and a gasp went up from the crowd like they was thunderstruck or something. For a moment a sickening silence reigned and then my Swedish shipmates started applauding, and some of the Swedes and Norwegians took it up, and, like people always do, got louder and louder till they was lifting the roof, three times I started to make my speech, and three times they drowned me out, till I run out of my short stock of patience, shut up, you lubbers. I roared, and they lapsed into sudden silence, gaping at me in amazement. With a menacing scowl, I said, De Spain happiest moment of my life, by thunder, they clapped kind of feebly and dazedly, and the referee motioned us to the center of the ring. And, as we faced each other, I gaped, and he barked, aha! Like a hyena which sees some critter caught in a trap. The referee was the big cheese I'd socked in the alley. I didn't pay much attention to Akin, but stared morbidly at the referee, 
which reeled off the instructions in some Scandinavian tongue. Hakan nodded and responded in kind, and the referee glared at me and snapped something and I nodded and grunted, ah, just as if I understood him, and turned back toward my corner. He stepped after me, and caught hold of my gloves. Under cover of examining M, he hissed, so low my handlers didn't even hear him, you are no Swede. I know you. You called your dog Mike. There is only one white bulldog in the Asiatics by that name. You are Steve Costigan, of the Sea Girl, keep it quiet, I muttered nervously, ha. Ah. He snarled. I will have my revenge. Go ahead fight your fight. After the bout is over, I will expose you as the imposter you are. These men will hang you to the rafters, gee whiz, I mumbled, what you want to do that for? Keep my secret and I'll slip you fifty bucks after the scrap, he merely snorted, ha. Ah. In disdain, pointing meaningly at the black eye which I had give him, and stalked back to the center of the ring. What did that Norwegian say to you? Bill O'Brien asked, I didn't reply. I was kind of wool-gathering. Looking out over the mob, I admit I didn't like the prospects. I has no doubt that them infuriated squareheads would be maddened at the knowledge that a alien had passed herself off as one of them and there's a limit to the numbers that even Steve Costigan can vanquish in mortal combat. But about that time the gong sounded, and I forgot everything except the battle before me, for the first time I noticed Huck and Talk Kilson and I realized why he had such a reputation. He was a regular panther of a man a tall, rangy, beautifully built young slugger with a mane of yellow hair and cold, steely eyes. He was six feet one to my six feet, and weighed one hundred and eighty-five to my one hundred and ninety. He was drained to the ounce, and his long, smooth muscles rippled under his white skin as he moved. My black mane must have contrasted strongly with his golden hair. He come in fast and ripped a left hook to my head whilst I come back with a right to the body which brung him up standing. But his body muscles was like iron ridges, and I knowed it would take plenty of pounding to soften him there, even though it was me doing the pounding. Hakan was a sharpshooter, and he begun to shoot his left straight and fast. All my opponents does, at first, thinking I'm a sucker for a left jab. But they soon abandons that form of attack. I ignores left jabs. I now walked through a perfect hail of em and crashed a thundering right under Hakan's heart which brung an astonished grunt out to him. Discarding his jabbing offensive, he started flailing away with both hands, and I want to tell you he wasn't throwing no powder puffs, it was the kind of scrapping I like. He was standing up to me, giving and taking, and I wasn't called on to run him around the ring like I got to do with so many of my foes. He was belting me plenty, but that's my style, and, with a wide grin, I slugged merrily at his body and head, and the gaunt found us in the center of the ring, banging away, the crowd gave us a roaring cheer as we went back to our corners, but suddenly my grin was wiped off by the sight of Yarsen, the referee, cryptically indicating his black eye as he glared morbidly at me, I determined to finish Torkilson as quick as possible, make a bold break through the crowd, and try to get away before Yarsen had time to tell him my fatal secret. Just as I started to tell Bill, I felt a hand jerking at my ankle. I looked down into the bewhiskered, bewildered and bleary-eyed face of the old man, Steve. He squawked. I'm in a terrible jam, Bill O'Brien jumped like he was stabbed. Don't yell Steve that away. He hissed. You want to get us all mopped? I'm in a terrible jam. Wailed the old man, wringing his hands. If you don't help me, I'm a ruined man, what's the lay? I asked in amazement, leaning through the ropes. It's Jid Jessup's fault, he moaned. The serpent got me into a argument and got me drunk. He knows I ain't got no sense when I'm soused. He horns bulled me into laying a bet on Tork Kilson. I didn't know you was going to fight, well, I said, that's tough. But you'll just have to lose the bet, I can't. He howled, bong. Went the gong, and I shot out in my corner as I can ripped out to his, I can't lose. The old man howled above the crowd. I bet the sea girl, what? I roared, momentarily forgetting where I was and half turning toward the ropes. Bang! I can nearly tore my head off with a free swinging right. Bellering angrily, I come back with a smash to the mush that started the claret, and we went into a slug fest, flailing free and generous with both hands, that Dane was tough. Smacks that would have staggered most men didn't make him wince. He come plowing in for more. But, just before the gong, I caught him off balance with a blazing left hook that knocked him into the ropes, and the Swedes arose, whooping like lions. Back on my stool I peered through the ropes. The old man was dancing a hornpipe, what's this about betting the sea girl? I demanded, when I come to myself a while ago, I found I'd wagered the ship. He wept, 
against Jessop's lousy tub, the nigger king, which I find is been condemned by the ship and board and wouldn't clear the bay without going to the bottom. He took an unfair advantage of me. I wasn't responsible when I made that bet, don't pay it, I growled, Jessop's a rat, he showed me a paper I signed while stewed, he groaned. It's a contract upholding the bet. If it weren't for that, I wouldn't pay. But if I don't, he'll ruin my reputation in every port of the seven seas. He'll show that contract and give me the name of a Welsher. You got to lose, gee whiz. I said, badgered beyond endurance. This is a pretty mess, bong. Went the gong, and I paced out into the ring, all upset and with my mind elsewhere. Hakan swarmed all over me, and drove me into the ropes, where I woke up and beat him off, but, with the old man's howls echoing in my ears, I failed to follow up my advantage, and Hakan come back strong, the Danes raised the roof as he battered me about the ring. But he wasn't hurting me none, because I covered up, and again, just before the gong, I snapped out of my crouch and sent him back on his heels with a wicked left hook to the head. The referee gave me a gloating look, and pointed at his black eye, and I had to grit my teeth to keep from socking him stiff. I sat down on my stool and listened gloomily to the shrieks of the old man, which was getting more unbearable every minute. You got to lose. He howled. If Torkilson don't win this fight, I'm ruined. If the bet had been on the level. I'd pay you know that. But, I've been swindled, and now I'm going to get robbed. Look at the rat over there, waving that devilish paper at me. It's more than human flesh and blood can stand. It's enough to drive a man to drink. You got to lose. But the boys has bet their shirts on me, I snarled, fit to be tied with worry and bewilderment. I can't lay down. I never throw out a fight. I don't know how, that's gratitude. He screamed, busting into tears. After all I've did for you. Little did I know I was warm in a serpent in my bosom. The poor house is staring me in the face, and you, or, shut up, you old seahorse. Said Bill. Steve I mean Lars has got enough to contend with without you howling and yelling like a manac. Them squareheads is gonna get suspicious if you and him keep talking in English. Don't pay no attention to him, Steve I mean Lars. Get that Dane. Well, the gong sounded and I went out all tore up in my mind and having just about lost heart in the fight. That's a most dangerous thing to have happen, especially against a man-killing slugger like Hakan Tork Kilsen. Before I knowed what was going on, the Swedes rose with a scream of warning and about a million stars bust in my head. I realized faintly that I was on the canvas, and I listened for the count to know how long I had to rest. I heard a voice droning above the roar of the fans, but it was plumb meaningless to me. I shook my head, and my sight cleared. John Yarson was standing over me, his arm going up and down, but I didn't understand a word he said. He was counting in Swedish, not daring to risk a moment, I heaved up before my head had really quit singing and Hakan come storming in like a typhoon to finish me, but I was mad clean through and had plumb forgot about the old man and his fool bet. I met Hakan with a left hook which nearly tore his head off, and the Swedes yelped with joy. I bored in, ripping both hands to the wind and heart, and, in a fast mix-up at close quarters, Hakan went down more from a slip than a punch. But he was wise and took account, resting on one knee. I watched the referee's arm so as to familiarize myself with the sound of the numerals but he wasn't counting in the same language as he had over me. I got it, then, he counted over me in Swedish and over Hakan in Danish. The languages is alike in many ways, but different enough to get me all mixed up, which didn't know a word in either tongue, and anyhow. I seen then that I was going to have an enjoyable evening. Hakan was up at nine I counted the waves of the referee's arm and he come up at me like a house of fire. I fought him off half-heartedly, whilst the Swedes shouted with amazement at the change which had come over me since the blazing first round. Well, I've said repeatedly that a man can't fight his best when he's got his mind on something else. Here was a nice mess for me to worry about. If I quit, I'll be a yellow dog and dispose myself for the rest of my life, and my shipmates would lose their money and so would all the Swedes which had bet on me and was now yelling and cheering for me just like I was their brother. I couldn't throw M down. Yet if I won, the old man would lose his ship, which was all he had and like a daughter to him. It would beggar him and break his heart. And, as a minor thought, whether I won or lost, that Scott Yarson was going to tell the crowd I wasn't no Swede, and get me mobbed. Every time I looked at him over Hakan's shoulder in a clinch, Yarson would touch his black eye meaningly. I was bogged down in gloom and I wished I could evaporate or something, back on my stool, between rounds. The old man wept and begged me to lay down, and Bill and my handlers implored me to wake up and kill Torkilson, and I thought I'd go nuts, 
I went out for the fourth round slowly, and Hakan, evidently thinking I'd lost my fighting heart, if any, come with his usual tigerish rush and biffed me three times in the face without a return, I dragged him into a grisly light clinch which he couldn't break, and as we wrestled and strained, he spat something at me which I couldn't understand, but I understood the tone of it. He was calling me yellow. Me, Steve Costigan. The terror of the high seas. With a maddened roar, I jerked away from him and crashed a murderous right to his jaw that nearly floored him. Before he could recover his balance, I tore into him like a wild man, forgetting everything except that I was Steve Costigan, the bully of the toughest ship afloat, slugging right and left, I rushed him into the ropes, where I pinned him, while the crowd went crazy. He crouched and covered up, taking most of my punches on the gloves and elbows, but I reckoned it looked to the mob like I was beating him to death. All at once, above the roar, I heard the old man screaming, Steve, for cat's sake, let up. I'll go on the beach, and it'll be your fault, that unnerved me. I involuntarily dropped my hands and recoiled, and Hakan, with fire in his eyes, lunged out of his crouch like a tiger and crashed his right to my jaw, bang. I was on the canvas again, and the referee was droning Swedish numerals over me. Not daring to take a count, and maybe get counted out unknowingly, I staggered up, and Hakan come lashing in. I throwed my arms around him in a grisly hug, and it took him and the referee both to break my hold, Hakan drove me staggering into the ropes with a wild man attack, but I'm always dangerous on the ropes, as many a good man has found out on coming to Inbiz dressing room. As I felt the rough strands against my back, I caught him with a slung shot right uppercut which snapped his head right back betwixt his shoulders, and this time it was him which fell into a clinch and hung on. Looking over his shoulder at that sea of bristling blonde heads and yelling faces, I seen various familiar figures. On one side of the ring near my corner the old man was dancing around like he was on a red-hot hatch, shedding maudlin tears and pulling his whiskers, and, on the other side, a skinny, shifty-eyed old seaman was whooping with glee and waving a folded paper. Cap Jid Jessup, the old cuss. He knew the old man would bet anything when he was drunk even bet the sea girl, as sweet a ship has ever rounded the horn against that rotten old hulk of a nigger king, which wasn't worth the cent a ton. And, near at hand, the referee, Yarsen, was whispering tenderly in my ear, as he broke our clinch, better let her can knock you stiff then you won't feel so much what the crowd does to you when I tell them who you are, back on my stool again, I put my face on Mike's neck and refused to listen, either to the pleas of the old man or to the profane shrieks of Bill O'Brien. By golly, that fight was like a nightmare. I almost hoped Hakan would knock my brains out and end all my troubles, I went out for the fifth like a man going to his own hanging. Hakan was evidently puzzled. Who wouldn't have been? Here was a fighter me who was performing in spurts, exploding in bursts of ferocious battling just when he appeared nearly out, and sagging half-heartedly when he looked like a winner. He come in, lashed a vicious left to my midsection, and dashed me to the canvas with a thundering overhand right. Maddened, I rose and dropped him with a wild roundhouse swing he wasn't expecting. Again the crowd surged to its feet, and the referee got flustered and started counting over Hakan in what sounded like Swedish. Hakan bounded up and slugged me into the ropes, off of which I floundered, only to slip in a smear of my own blood on the canvas, and again, to the disgust of the Swedes, I found myself among the resin. I looked about, heard the old man yelling for me to stay down, and saw old Captain Jessup waving his blame fool can track. I arose, only half aware of what I was doing, and bang. Hakan caught me on the ear with a hurricane swing, and I sprawled on the floor, half under the ropes. Goggling dizzily at the crowd from this position, I found myself staring into the distended eyes of Captain J. Jessup, which was standing up, almost touching the ring. Evidently froze at the thought of losing his bet with me on the canvas he was standing the gaping. His arm still lifted with the contract which he'd been waving at the old man, with me, thinking is acting. One swoop of my gloved paw swept that can track out of his hand. He yawped with surprise and come lunging half through the ropes. I rolled away from him, sticking the can track in my mouth and chawing as fast as I could. Cam Jessup grabbed me by the hair with one hand and tried to jerk the can track out of my jaws with the other one, but all he got was a severely bit finger. At this, he let go of me and began to scream and yell. Give me back that paper, you cannibal. He's e ate in my can track. I'll sue you, meanwhile. The dumbfounded referee, overcome with amazement, had stopped counting, and the crowd, not understanding this by play, was roaring with astonishment. Jessup began to crawl through the ropes, and Yasin yelled something and shoved him back with his foot. He started through again, yelling blue murder, and a big Swede, evidently thinking he was trying to attack me, 
swung once with a fist the size of a corking mallet, and Captain Jessup bit the dust. I rose with my mouth full of paper, and Hakan promptly banged me on the chin with a right he started from his heels. Ow, Jerushal. Wait till somebody hits you on the jaw when you're chawing something. I thought for a second every tooth in my head was shattered, along with my jaw burn. But I reeled groggily back into the ropes and began to swallow hurriedly, bang. Hakan wanged me on the ear. Gulp. I said. Wham. He socked me in the eye. Gullop. I said. Blop. He pasted me in the stomach. Oh if glup. I said. Wang. He took me on the side of the head. Gulp. I swallowed the last of the contract, and went for that dane with fire in my eyes. I banged Hakan with a left that sunk out a sight in his belly, and nearly tore his head off with a paralyzing right before he realized that, instead of being ready for the cleaners, I was stronger than ever and roaring for action. Nothing loath, he rallied, and we went into a whirlwind of hooks and swings till the world spun like a merry-go-round. Neither of us heard the gong, and our seconds had to drag us apart and lead us to our corners. Steve, the old man was jerking at my leg and weeping with gratitude, I seen it all. That old polecat's got no hold on me now. He can't prove I ever made that fool bet. You're a scholar and a gent one of nature's own nobleman. You've saved the sea girl, let that be a lesson to you, I said, spitting out a fragment of the contract along with a mouthful of blood. Gambling is sinful. Bill, I got a watch in my pants pocket. Get it and bet it that I lay this square head within three more rounds and I come out for the sixth like a typhoon. I'm going to get mobbed by the fans as soon as the fight's over and Yarsin spills the beans, I thought. But I'll have my fun now, for once I'd met a man which was willing and able to stand up and slug it out with me. Hakan was as lithe as a panther and as tough as spring steel. He was quicker than me, and hit nearly as hard. We crashed together in the center of the ring, throwing all wheeled into the storm of battle, through a red mist I seen Hakan's eyes blazing with an unearthly light. He was plumb berserk, like the old Vikings which was his ancestors. And all the Irish fighting madness took hold of me, and we ripped and tore like tigers. We was the center of a frenzied whirlwind of gloves, ripping smashes to each other's bodies which you could hear all over the house, and socks to each other's heads that spattered blood all over the ring. Every blow packed dynamite and had the killer's lust behind it. It was a test of endurance. At the gong, we had to be tore apart and dragged to our corners by force. And, at the beginning of the next round, we started in where we left off. We reeled in a blinding hurricane of gloves. We slipped in smears of blood, or was knocked to the canvas by each other's thundering blows. The crowd was limp and idiotic, drooling wordless screeches. And the referee was bewildered and muddled. He counted over us in Swedish, Danish and Norwegian alike. Then I was on the canvas, and Hakan was staggering on the ropes, gasping, and the befuddled Jarsen was counting over me. And, in the dizzy maze, I recognized the language. He was counting in Spanish, you ain't no Norwegian. I said, glaring groggily up at him, four. He said, shifting into English. As much as you're a Swede. Five. A man's got to eat. Six. They wouldn't have given me this job seven exclamation mark if I hadn't pretended to be a Norwegian. Eight. I'm John Jones, a vaudeville linguist from Frisco. Nine. Keep my secret and I'll keep yours, the gong. Our handlers dragged us off to our corners and worked over us. I looked over at Hukin. I was marked plenty a split ear, smashed lips, both eyes half closed, nose broken but them's my usual adornments. Hukin wasn't marked up so much in the face outside of a closed eye and a few gashes but his body was raw beef from my continuous body hammering. I drawled a deep breath and grinned gargoyleishly. With the old man and that fake referee off of my mind, I could give all my thoughts to the battle, the gong banged again, and I charged like an enraged bull. Hakan met me as usual, and rocked me with thundering lefts and rights. But I bored in, driving him steadily before me with ripping, bone-shattering hooks to the body and head. I felt him slowing up. The man don't live which can slug with me. Like a tiger scenting the kill, I redoubled the fury of my onslaught, and the crowd arose, roaring, as they foresaw the end. Nearly on the ropes. Hakan rallied with a dying burst of ferocity, and moment really had me reeling under a fusillade of desperate swings. But I shook my head doggedly and ploughed in under his barrage, ripping my terrible right under his heart again and again, and tearing at his head with mallet-like left hooks, flesh and blood couldn't stand it. Hakan crumpled in a neutral corner under a blastant fire of left and right hooks. He tried to get his legs under him, but a child could see he was done. The referee hesitated, then raised my right glove 
and the Swedes and Norwegians came roaring into the ring and swept me off for my feet. A glance showed Hawkins Danes carrying him to his corner, and I tried to get to him to shake his hand, and tell him he was as brave and fine a fighter as I ever met which was the truth and nothing else but my delirious followers had boosted both me and Mike on their shoulders and were carrying us toward the dressing room like a king or something. A tall form come surging through the crowd, and Mushy Hansen grabbed my gloved hand and yelled, Boy, you done us proud. I'm sorry the Danes had to lose, but, after a battle like that, I can't hold no grudge. I couldn't stay away from the scrap. Hooray for the old sea girl, the fightinist ship on the seven seas, and the Swedish captain, which had acted as an answer, barged in front of me and yelled in English, You may be a Swede, but if you are, you're the most unusual looking Swede I ever saw. But I don't give a whoop. I've just seen the greatest battle since Gustavus Adolphus licked the Dutch. Skull, Lars Lovarsen, and all the Swedes and Norwegians thundered, Skull, Lars Lovarsen. They want you to make a speech, said Mushy. All right, I said. De Spain happiest moment of my life, louder, said Mushy. They're making so much noise they can't understand you, anyhow. Say something in a foreign language, all right, I said, and yelled the only foreign words I could think of. Parley vous français. Vive la Stockholm. Erin Gobra, and they bellowed louder than ever. A fighting man is a fighting man in any language, 